Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Cheryl Stenstrom, and I, along with Drs. Uh, Sue Almond and Deborah Hicks, um, co-lead the uh, San Jose State University iSchool's Leadership and Management Advisory Committee. Uh, a couple of years ago, that committee um, had been talking a lot about how one of the things that they struggle with when they're um, talking to students or new grads or anyone looking for a job is the need for ongoing development in their leadership and management skills. And so to that end, um, we started to develop a series of webinars that focused on how uh, students and new professionals and seasoned professionals could um, uh, learn vicariously uh, through a series of speakers who talked about um, both what it was like on the job in it, to be in the shoes of a leader, but also uh, to possess uh, leadership qualities at any position. Um, and uh, ran that as a, a four part series over um, spring of, um, sorry, I forget the year, but I think it was 2017. So since then we have aimed as a committee to put on a couple of web webinars a year and expand our offerings and expand the uh, wonderful speakers that we've been able to profile. Uh, and uh, the different angles and uh, insights that they can bring to the topic of leadership. So earlier this year, um, uh, Dr. Allman had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, Rebecca Smith Aldrich, who um, is a leader in sustainability for libraries. So we're thrilled that she is here with us today uh, and we are able to um, feature what she can share with us about sustainability in libraries. Before we turn the mic over to Rebecca, we're going to um, just give you a bit of background information about her and um, say that what, we'll, what our format is for the day is uh, to have her speak and then we'll have plenty of time at the end of the um, uh, presentation for questions and comments um, that we can all share uh, before we log off for the end of the day. So um, having said that, um, I will tell you that Rebecca Smith Aldrich is the executive director of the Mid Hudson Library System. She currently serves as the co chair of the American Library Association's Special Task Force on Sustainability, as an advisory board member for the ALA Center for the Future of Libraries, and she's also the co founder of the, both the ALA Sustainability Roundtable and the New York Library Association Sustainability Initiative. She's a frequent international speaker on the topic of libraries and sustainability, and she's the author of Sustainable Thinking, Ensuring Your Library's Future uh, in an Uncertain World and Resilience, uh, part of the Library Future series from ALA Editions. She's also the sustainability columnist for the Library Journal. Uh, so you can also find out more about her work at uh, sustainablelibraries.org. So, um, Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca and uh, hear what she has to um, teach us all about sustainability in libraries today. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, so hello everyone and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I had a smile on my face as you described the leadership and management goals of this webinar because I used to be the president of the leadership and management section of the New York Library Association and it was probably one of the best uh, personal and professional experiences of my career. I'm getting a chance to really hear from people in the field who have been I think uh, through experiences that you can't quite predict and figuring out how you hone your leadership skills uh, when you don't know what's coming next sometimes is a very uh, cool thing to learn about. And I think that's a big part of what I'm here to talk to you about today in terms of sustainable thinking for the future of libraries. I just wanted to give you a little more background about what I've been doing for the past 20 years. I have been here in New York for the past 20 years and doing work uh, for the Mid-Hudson Library System primarily with 66 public libraries. Uh, all of whom, or most of whom, have public votes on their budget. Um, so I've spent a lot of my time in my career as a library development specialist, which is a non-traditional role in the library profession, probably. Um, and they let me pick my own title, which was probably a big mistake. So uh, in 2008, my title became the Coordinator for Library Sustainability, which made a lot of people think all I did was build sustainably designed buildings. But what I was actually working on was making sure my libraries were these three things vital visible 
and viable because I wanted them to have sustainable funding. Um, so I spent a lot of time explaining my title, which uh, made me really good at talking about it. Um, so just to give you an idea of the type of work I've been doing for the past 20 years, uh, we've been taking a look at how vital our libraries, are they actually meeting the needs of our communities? Are they visible to people know we exist and that we have stuff they want? And are they actually viable? Do they have the capacity to meet their community's needs? And capacity takes a, a, very, a variety of forms, right? That could be the money you need, the staff training you need, board education for trustees, director coaching to make sure directors who may or may not have been able to go to library school or who went to library school but never learned how to win a building referendum or design a building or uh, design new programs and services that respond to the changing needs of their community. It meant I've got a lot of exposure to how 66 libraries do things here in my system. And then about 10 years ago, I started my own consulting company helping libraries outside of my system throughout New York and the rest of the country. And then in the past few years, I've been working on some uh, very exciting projects related to sustainability in a holistic way that I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking to you about here today. But I thought it would be important for you to understand the origin of this work. Um, and we are going to talk about environmental sustainability, no doubt. But the truth is that libraries cannot live on love alone. We need funding to do what we do. And so when I think about being a leader in the library profession, I often, you know, I try to be humble about that, but the truth is you do have to own being a leader in the library profession if you want to attract investment, financial investment in your library. And in most situations, at least on the East Coast, we have public votes on library budgets. So you might be doing presentations to municipalities or other decision makers who decide about the funding for your institution. This is something that's everyone's responsibility, no matter what you do in a library, is being articulate about why your library matters, why what you do matters, uh, and really understanding how proactive we have to be about this in the future in light of recent research on the topic. Perhaps you saw this report, which came out last year from Awareness to Funding, which updated a report from 2008, looking at voter perception and support of public libraries. And this was uh, a report in 2008 that meant a, a lot to me because I work on uh, referendums all the time. I've done over 100 campaigns in my career, helping libraries attract both operating funds and facility funding for expansion and renovation. And when you think about how hard it is to ask people to tax themselves more for library services, you better be doing a pretty good job and being very well spoken about it uh, in order to warrant someone voting yes to tax themselves more. And this new report it was, uh, I'll admit it, it was a little depressing because it said in the past 10 years we've seen a 15% decline in the out of the gate number of possible yes voters. So without doing any education, we're further behind the eight ball than we used to be 10 years ago. 40% decline in the number of voters who think that librarians are well known in the community. So our visibility, our connectivity with other people in our communities has declined a great deal, which means you are starting from, again, even further behind the starting line than we were 10 years ago. And then, you know, a lesser percentage there, but a decline in a number of things that really hurt my heart. Uh, a 20% decline in the number of voters who agree that we're an excellent resource for kids or that we have an excellent public library as a source of pride in the community or that librarians are friendly and approachable. Um, so it always makes me think of customer service training I received a number of years ago where they said, if you have a bad customer service experience, someone will tell that story seven times. If they have a good customer service experience, they might tell that story one or two times. So it really speaks to how much time and energy must be put in to how we talk about ourselves, how we advocate for ourselves, and the nonverbal cues that we give out in our institutions that tell the story of who we are, uh, which means we have to be extremely strategic about where we're going in the future uh, with our libraries. Regardless of the type of library you end up working in, I encourage you right now to start honing your vision for the future of libraries because it will take you literally years to articulate that in a way that will make people want to follow you, believe in you, and invest their time, energy, and money in the vision that you have for the future. So I wanted to give you some tips about that that have been extremely helpful to me in my work uh, so far in libraries. And I mentioned that uh, I've worked on over 100 campaigns and I will say that that's all well and good, but did we win? That's what most people ask me next. And I can say that in 20 years, I have a 93% success rate. So I think most of the time things are going pretty good. So some of this stuff might be useful to you in the future. 
And one of the most incredibly important things I use with my libraries is this idea of starting with why. And I'm sorry if that little graphic is too tiny for you to read, but this is based on a book by a gentleman named Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Uh, he got quite famous thanks to a TED Talk he did. It's about 14 minutes long. The book is also an easy read, but if you're short on time, given that you're in graduate school, I could understand that. Um, but it's a great read, good TED Talk. He's a business consultant looking for patterns in businesses. And one of the things he pulled out was he noticed that companies that were getting a faster leg up than others back in the 80s and 90s were those who were doing messaging different than their competitors. They were starting with messages of why they do what they do rather than just itemizing the specifications of a product or itemizing the items you could buy from their company. It gives the great example of Apple. And I bet many of you have an iPhone or a, a, a iPad. Maybe you're watching this webinar on an iPad right now. And he talks about how they talked about why they made this product. They wanted user-centered, aesthetically pleasing design. And in the 1980s, that resonated with more people who weren't techie enough to understand how the other computer companies were selling computers when they were selling them based on the specifications of the technology. Uh, faster memory, bigger monitors, more uh, capacity. And people were like, I don't even know what to do with a computer in my house. But hey, if it's computers and I need to learn it, and it's designed for a human, that sounds better to me. And they got more of the market share faster because they switched the way they did the, mar the messaging and starting with why. And so when we do assessments of our library's websites, we often see these itemizations of what you have to offer, what programs you have to offer, what technology you have to offer, very little messaging on why you do those things. So making that assumption that everyone understands why libraries are amazing and necessary and essential is one of the number one mistakes we make. So as a good leader, Leader, um, really understanding how to articulate the why behind the what is one of the key things that we do. And when I think about the why behind the what of the libraries that I get to work with, at the end of the day, it really does come down to do we care about our neighbors? Are we helping them in their lives and providing resources, tools, and information that help them enhance their own lives, the lives of their children, the lives of their community to make the world a better place? And that might sound you know, enormous, but because it is. When you really think about everything we do in libraries, whether it's helping somebody research genealogy or find a job or help their kid do better at school or they're advancing their own career or making a job shift, all of it is really, related to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So when we think about how to deeply embed that messaging, the why behind the what we do, we have to start at the very top and think about the entire ecology of a community and people's lives in this ecology. So in 2014, when I was kind of mulling over this thinking of how we do this work and how we talk about it, this report came out from the United Nations and it caught my eye in the New York Times because the commentator noted, that there was many reports that came out from this group, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But this was the first one uh, that said, environmentally, it was no longer about saving the earth, it was going to be about surviving the earth. That climate change had wrought enough damage at this point that we were going to see sea levels rise. You will see food shortages, you will have air quality control issues, and humans now have to figure out how to adapt in the face of that. The other reports that were coming out were scarier and scarier, talking about the level of devastation we will see in the next few decades as sea waters rise, what it's gonna look like when air quality control issues are, are getting worse and worse and exacerbating existing health problems. Looking at food security issues, we actually have food deserts here in upstate New York, which is something I never thought I would say. Uh, and then the, the issue uh, that is just the basic math of our, our economy and our world today, which is when there are scarcity issues, it means a rising opportunity for conflict amongst people. And that might be, as many of us have seen in the past few years, really at the very civil uh, disobedience or civil clashing level that we've seen throughout our own country that we're seeing in Hong Kong right now. These are things that are really happening right now. They're not waiting until 2030. They're not waiting until 2050. It's happening right now. 
We experienced this this, this summer with, with heat waves that are coming, and that's going to be coming more and more frequently. Uh, there's a World Health Organization estimation. We're going to see close to 40,000 more deaths a, a year worldwide because of heat waves. So it's not just for people who live on the coasts. It's not just for people who live in a desert or someplace that's already having trouble with agriculture. It's right here in your backyard right now. And I think that's the, the messaging that we're starting to hear get louder and louder amongst the climate activists in our world. I think many of you heard of this young lady this year, uh, the really the impetus behind the climate marches uh, very recently here in America and across the world. And she really kicked things off less, almost less than a year and a half ago. I actually counted. It was 394 days ago. This young woman got in front of a bunch of very powerful adults and talking about climate change, the impact on her future. And she told them point blank, I don't want your hope. I want you to act. I want you to do something. Act as if the house was on fire because it is. So when we think about the future of libraries and what our legacy is going to be, we have to incorporate the thinking surrounding how we're going to adapt in the face of climate change into our everyday work as well as our programmatic work, our service design work, because if we don't, the future generations will look back at our institutions and say, where were you? Why weren't you our ally in doing this work? This is a, a diagram you may have seen from Psych 101 called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. We're talking about things that really are going to affect people at the most basic level of their lives, food, water, their ability to sleep at night if they even have a place to sleep. You're going to see an increasing number of people in strife and in stress. So I know a lot of my friends, uh, my, one of my co-presenters, Matt Bollerman, he often says, you know, I got into this business thinking I was going to be working at the top of this triangle. I was going to be doing classes on Picasso and listening to Dvorak in the library and, and working on self-actualization of my community, but he finds himself working more towards the middle and bottom of this pyramid uh, more frequently as a library director uh, where he serves in our community. So very interesting to think about reshaping uh, service design, program design, making sure we're actually responding to real life community needs today, not what we wish their community needs were, but what they actually are. So one of the absolute coolest things I have seen in very recent memory is another report from that bizarre organization I just told you about, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, because they've issued report after report with very technical information about the impact of climate change and what it's going to be doing to the environmental world around us and calling for us to adapt our economy at a speed that is unprecedented. And it's overwhelming. We're not even sure where to start. So this group of scientists scientists came up with four things we should all focus on, the things the world needs right now. And wait till you see what they are because the light bulb is going to go off for you just like it did for me. What the world needs now is locally focused problem solving, people working together, people who recognize and value diversity because the diversity of opinion and experience is where we're going to get the creative solutions we need to face the future and for all to be heard. Now, who is perfectly positioned to do this work? That is us. That is libraries. We are excellent at this kind of thing. Is anyone writing about libraries in these reports? No, they're not. Whose fault is that? That is our fault. So we need to start talking about ourselves and doing things that get the, the attention they deserve and doing things that actually make a huge difference in our communities with purpose. Not just having a cool idea and hoping it works, but actually doing the work doing the study, collecting the data, translating that on behalf of our communities. And I'll share with you that a few years ago, actually two years ago, I was at my own state conference talking about this issue with youth, uh, youth services librarians. And I will completely admit I was very tired during the, uh, the uh, presentation. And I was on my soapbox right where I am in this presentation right now. And I said, you know what, people? we're going to library science the shit out of this. And the room erupted with laughter and I was completely embarrassed. I couldn't believe I had done that in the middle of a presentation. And now I do it all the time because somebody who I have tracked down, put it on a tote bag and as a joke, sent it to me as a gift. And then without telling me, opened up an Etsy shop. And I found out because I was at the JFK airport and a woman walked by me with this tote bag and I didn't know her. And then I kept getting pictures and texts with more and more people who have this tote bag. <laughs> so it's 
awesome to me to think about the fact that we are getting riled up about these issues and understanding that we are scientists too. And we can use the platform we have at our libraries to address some of the biggest challenges facing our communities right now if we choose to own that role in our communities and our campuses and in our schools. So that's what I've been working on for the past few years is how do we develop leadership on the topic of sustainability in libraries. And you may have noticed in the uh, description of this webinar that ALA, the American Library Association, in January at their midwinter meeting has now adopted sustainability as a core value, something that lo and behold right here today is being exposed to library students, library school students. It's being woven into curriculum in library schools all over the country. I'm dealing with probably six universities right now asking me for advice of how we start exposing this issue, teaching it, embedding it in the leadership skill set of our future library leaders. So what I want to do for you today is just to give you a taste of some of the stuff that I think is, is pretty critical to understand around this issue. As you think about your own professional development, you put together your own individual professional development plan. These might be things you want to learn more about. Um, there's some terminology that's starting to get repeated again and again that you're going to start to see if you haven't already. And one of the most important things is that we're all defining the word sustainability using the same language. So the American Library Association has adopted what's called the triple bottom line definition of sustainability. Because what we discovered in our work here in New York on the topic of sustainability was everyone assumes it's just about the environment, but nothing on our world exists in a silo. As John Muir, the uh, famous environmentalist said, once you pull on one thread in the universe, you find it connected to everything else. So we have to have a whole systems approach to thinking about how to address issues related to sustainability. And so this definition helps us understand it's really the intersection of three things. It's whether or not a product, a building, a community, a library, has this balance amongst these three things of being economically feasible, environmentally sound, and socially equitable. Now libraries are pretty good on at least two or three of these things, maybe not all three, maybe not equally well, but we talk about this sometimes as a three-legged stool because if one of these things is out of balance, the stool will tip over. And I think this is the future challenge of library leaders in our profession, is how you make operational decisions for your library, programmatic and service de decisions that address the whole situation, not just one of these things or the other. Because within that center spot of this Venn diagram is where we find sustainability and resilience for our communities, for our students, for the people that we serve, and for ourselves as institutions and professionals. So this concept, we've been talking about this for a long time uh, in libraries for the past five years only. This has been the construct that they've been using worldwide for a very long time in one of my favorite reports that comes out every year, which is the World Happiness Report. I don't know if anyone else geeks out about this report like I do. But they have created a metric system to figure out what are the happiest countries in the world and what do they judge them on. This is going to sound kind of familiar now that you know about the triple bottom line. They talk about four pillars, sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development, environmental conservation, preservation and promotion of culture, and good governance. Libraries are once again perfectly positioned to assist with these four things and exhibit these four things within their own institutions. So thinking about this work from the inside out, embedding it into the ethos of how we run libraries, how we manage departments, how we run our teams, how we make decisions, this is going to help position libraries as more and more capable to do and help with this work in the wider community. So what we've posited here in, in New York, and it's, it's a, a phrase that I use an awful lot, is this idea of sustainable thinking. It's not a checklist that you have by your side or you pull out in April for Earth Day. Uh, it's not uh, that thing that would be nice if we would remember to do it when we're planning a project. It needs to be completely embedded in how you think all the time. It needs to be the lens through which you view the world and you make decisions. So I'm sure many of you have been in a situation where you've had to wordsmith by committee, and this is one of those phrases. <laughs> um, so it's a very long definition in my opinion, but the, it pulls together the things we've been talking about so far this afternoon. Um, sustainable thinking takes your core values as a library, and we're talking about your core values like a commitment to democracy, lifelong learning, social responsibility, access to information, all of those core values and the resources you have to deliver on those core values, whether it be your staff, your collections, your facility, and align that with the local and global communities right to sustainability, resilience, 
resilience and regeneration and really thinking about how to infuse new and energetic life into our communities through the library. And I think just not being a passive organization that waits for people to come to us, but we're actively engaged with our constituency, understanding what they're trying to do and making sure our resources and our efforts match with their aspirations in their community. So again, very big picture, but we have to start getting real about this. How do you actually make this happen? So one of the things I've been watching really closely is the Wellbeing Pro Project out of Santa Monica in California. They got a, a $1 million grant from the Bloomberg Foundation to figure out how to measure well-being in their community. And I was thinking this is a, an excellent way for us to organize our thinking, in particular for public libraries as well, when we think about the impact of the work that we do. Because part of being a leader is not just having a vision and getting people to follow you in that vision, but it's also to gut check and actually measure, did you make a difference with the choices that you made? So I think it's an interesting way to break out how we think about what we do and why it matters and how we're going to measure things in the future to make sure we're actually making a difference for our community. And what you work on in particular might look different depending on the region of the country or the region of the world you're in. It might look different based on the economy of the community you live in or the age and demographic issues that you're contending with. But I think, again, a good way to reorganize our thinking and understanding it's not just about education. Education does not exist in a vacuum. It exists for a purpose, and it should be tied to the well-being of those that we serve. Um, so each of you will end up in a different library institution and in a different role in those institutions. But I think some of this thinking and the structured way to view the world could be helpful to you in the future. Because what I really see for the future is a role for libraries as, as catalysts and conveners. Catalysts in that we model our choices in terms of how we wish our community was living, that we treat our staff right. We have uh, living wages and benefits for them, that we treat them well when it comes to their own well-being, because that will translate into how we treat our patrons, that we build our buildings and operate our buildings the way they should be with the idea of human health in mind, both inside those buildings and from where the materials came from to build those buildings. As you can tell, I could go on and on talking about that aspect of what we do. Um, the other idea of being a convener, to bring people together, just like the United Nations report suggested, that we need local problem solving to figure out what's going to happen next and how we all respond to that and if it's not locally grown who's going to do that work and libraries are well positioned to help bring together the right players to provide meeting space for that work to provide research and information for that work that needs to be done so if we don't start now to position ourselves as players who are going to be helping with these things we're going to get left behind people are going to wonder what the heck we're doing over there and why their tax dollars are going to those libraries so i wanted to show you examples of libraries who are ahead of the curve on this issue who get it who are really doing the work and embedding this kind of stuff not only in their library operations but in how they're connecting with their constituents. And one of the first examples I ever came across that caught my attention was a Canadian library, the West Vancouver Memorial Library, who right in their strategic plan has adopted sustainability as one of their core values. And if you take a study of this library, you will see their values, particularly in the area of sustainability, reflected in the choices they make about their facilities, about their outreach, about their programming, about their messaging. It is infused and embedded throughout that organization. So living your values, I think, is something as a future leader to really think about how does that come to life? You need to embed this stuff in your organization. It can't just be in your head. You have to make it very visible. So when you say to somebody that you manage your resources responsibly to maintain the financial, social, and environmental sustainability for the well-being of our community, who is going to argue with that? That is an amazing thing to be working on as an institution that's tax supported. And then pro tip, you couple that with a picture of a cute kid and you're going to have a golden time with this. People are totally going to get it. But I will point out that if you make a study of this library, they also had adopted sustainability in their previous strategic plan five years earlier. However, it was worded differently. It talked about the sustainability of the library. And you know what? Nobody cares about that except for library administration. What the community cares about is what are you doing for them? How are you translating a return on investment that they've made in you for their benefit, for the benefit of their community? So making sure you're always having your messaging face outwards and demonstrate how you impact the wider world. This is where we start to build our base of support and people buy into what we're doing. They actually use the services and programs we design for them. And then everything starts to come full circle and work pretty well for most libraries. 
So the other cool thing that I've noticed about libraries uh, and why I think it's really relevant to this topic of leadership and management is we're so local. We're like micro local, particularly for public libraries, where you get to really find out the flavor of your community, uh, the characters who live in your town, what people are trying to work together to do. And we get to really focus and hone in on supporting that with the resources we have and the creativity we bring to the table as library scientists. Because in, in most people's experiences who have studied this issue in sociology, they find that most communities they have everything they need within the community it's just not catalyzed or activated or people don't know each other to bring together the minds that need to be in the same room to figure things out so we're seeing more and more examples of that in libraries and this kind of mentality when we think about how far away do you feel like I am right now from the topic of environmental sustainability but the truth is the things that are going to happen in your community that are related to environmental sustainability are different than what's going to happen in somebody else's community. So unless the people who actually live there understand the uh, environmental world around them, how the economy shapes the world around them, how social equity issues shape the world around them, they're going to have a hard time coming together to figure out solutions for the future. One of the best programs I see in my region that is doing this work right now is the Repair Cafe. This is a program that was created in Amsterdam and the Netherlands and it's been brought over to the US. We have a very high concentration of these cafes in the Hudson Valley and I can see it creeping across America. And sometimes they're called different things. This is a brand and you have a DIY toolkit to do it yourself. But the idea behind it is that there are people in your community who know how to fix things and they're willing to teach you how to fix things or help you fix things. And by working together to fix things, maybe we don't have to rely on buying more new things and keep some stuff out of the, of the transfer station and actually get to know each other and actually respect each other and create more of a neighborhood or community feel through our libraries. And I have to say, I've gone to four of these so far in different regions of our state and the characters who are there are all different but the vibe is the same. They're excited to be together. They think it's so cool they're helping out each other and they're so grateful to the library for bringing them together so they could learn something new and meet each other. And at the, again, at the end of the day, isn't that what this is really all about is to strengthen those social bonds that people have so they can take care of one another and actually be a, a true community, not people to just happen to live in the same zip code. The other cool thing we're seeing is more and more self-sufficiency, which is exactly related to that repair cafe idea. More programming in libraries that teaches people how the world works and how they can control their own food consumption, where their food comes from, preserving their own food, making stuff last longer so they're not a slave to the consumer culture, um, really owning and having resilience in the face of whatever the economy happens to throw your way is a growing area of concern for more and more people in our communities. Again, library has almost access to all of the wisdom in the world. We need to activate that on behalf of our communities to make them stronger in the face of whatever might come in the future. So we've got these long-term self-sufficiency issues, but also some very acute self-sufficiency issues related to community resilience. We're gonna be seeing more and more severe weather throughout the world. And our ability to prepare for that and recover from it needs to be a local community effort. And libraries should be a part of that effort, whether it be how your building plays a part in the recovery efforts, or perhaps how you're connected to the wider network of people thinking about this stuff and helping people prepare for the future. This is an active project I have now now I've partnered with the New Jersey State Library and we're working with FEMA Region 1, uh, so the, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, and we're working on having libraries, they're testing out with library leaders, being preparedness ambassadors, people in our communities who understand the most likely things that could happen in your region of the world and know who the players are in your community to be talking to each other, to have plans in place so that more people are not as devastatingly affected by something as they could be if no one cared about what happens in your region of the world. So we've been encouraging our libraries to connect more fully with the first responder community. As an example for one of my libraries in uh, Putnam County, New York, they have a first responder thank you picnic every year now, which brings together a segment of the community that normally wouldn't be coming to the library. Um, these are people who sometimes feel that the library is a comp competition for tax dollars. But understanding that these are all good people from the library side, from the first responder side, who really are trying to do the same thing, which is to make their community a, a better place, but they're doing so 
in different ways. So finding common ground by saying thank you and expressing gratitude and not necessarily expecting those people to convert into library card holders, but understanding we're all part of the same community. And if we all know each other, we can work together better to make things uh, work well for us in the face of whatever comes next. So this quote uh, from uh, Joe Siglitz, that we forget the true source of the wealth of the nation is the creativity and innovation of its people. Uh, the real, I think, secret ingredient to the future of the health of our communities and the viability of, of our libraries are how much attention we pay to the idea of social cohesion. How well people know each other, respect each other, and have empathy for one another. Because if we can make those three things come to life, that's gonna solve a multitude of problems that face our communities, whether they be economic, whether they be societally related, technological, or environmental, it would mean more people are willing to work together to figure things out. And the power of that cannot be underestimated. I put together a couple examples to show you this uh, idea here of what I'm talking about because it's really very simple. We're just talking about bringing people together who wouldn't normally have the chance to become better neighbors. Uh, there's a great example here out in Colorado from the Anything Libraries where they have block parties and they encourage people to just get together and, and break bread and, and have a conversation. Then their first block party, they set up this uh, filming station where they had a little fishbowl there with picture. Uh, you would pull out a little slip and have a conversation. It was a conversation starter. And they asked people who had never met each other before to sit down and have a conversation. Not about something political or something controversial, but just to get to know each other as humans. Another awesome example of that uh, is found in Maryland and the Choose Civility programming they were doing down there a couple of years ago. This is called The Longest Table, inviting people to have dinner together. And there's seriously a hundred tables strung together here. And you're sitting across from people you might never have sat down with before and getting to know each other a little better and understanding that they're probably kind of just like you at the end of the day. Another great example from a rural library up in New Hampshire, where there's no more small town newspaper, the library decided to be the newspaper. They train teenagers to go to public meetings and report on what's going on. They solicit news from the other tax supported agencies to make sure the citizens know what's going on in their own institutions. And the newspaper comes from the library, a trusted source in the community for factual information. So while one system fell apart in terms of the local press and the local journalists, we've rebuilt it um, because people want to know what's going on. They want to be informed and the library is a really logical place for that work to be done. Another cool example is you're seeing all over uh, New York here. We've got tons of um, farmers fairs going on at libraries, places where farmers in our region are saying they don't have a place to bring their products to market. So you're seeing farmers markets crop up at libraries, which is a great uh, a marriage. Uh, the library farm up in Cicero, New York, they actually have a food desert where it's very expensive to get fresh fruits and vegetables. And so the library director looked out the back door of the library and she realized she had a couple of acres that no one was using and they created a library farm where you use your library card and you rent space to grow your own fruits and vegetables and there's community supported agriculture where they grow fresh fruits and vegetables to donate to the local pantries and for people who are struggling to afford or to grow their own food so very basic things changing perhaps the what people might think a library is going to be doing but building on the exact model we've been using for uh, hundreds of years the idea of a sharing economy that we don't all have to own everything that we can help each other and teach each other the things that we need um, so just extrapolating that out in some new ways I, I put that picture in the upper left hand corner of the um, beekeeper to remind me to share with you two things one that I have a library that has a live beehive inside the library I don't go in that library anymore but uh, and another library because they have that there because the beekeeping community they meet at the library and they were very intrigued with how they could connect local people with local experts uh, and I saw a couple years ago there was an IMLS grant given to Syracuse University to figure out how to catalog people like if you've got a local expert how could you have them in your online catalog so when you did that search on beekeeping you got the how-to book the how-to video and a note that uh joe smith down the road your own neighbor he's a master beekeeper and willing to talk to you i thought it was a very cool construct which really speaks to the popularity of programming in libraries these days because some people like to learn by actually meeting someone and doing something in person and experiencing something and having your neighbors do that work with you is a pretty cool way to get that done 
Another big thing we're looking at is how we connect people with the outdoor world. This is one of my libraries, again in Putnam County actually, uh, the Butterfield Library. With your library card, you can uh, get camping equipment, bird watching kits, uh, treks, so you can go on a hike with your family. Um, so looking at how we create experiences with nature, the disconnection people have from nature is a big part of the reason we have climate change issues today, because people forget that the choices we make impact the wider world around us. So you're not going to get away from talking with me without me giving a, a punch here for uh, greener buildings. This is where I actually got my start in true environmental sustainability work in libraries. You'll notice in my bio, I'm a lead AP, a leadership in energy and environmental design accredited professional. It's a big mouthful. Um, I actually don't care which if, you're, if you have the opportunity to build a building or renovate a building during your career, I don't care which of these things you follow or which construct that you use, but I encourage you to mandate at the beginning of any project you work on that you deploy sustainable design and energy efficient design. And we think about the future of our facilities and the health of the people who use our facilities. This is critical uh, to being a leader in the built environment. I'll just share real quick one of my favorite libraries that I've worked on. Uh, it's in Ulster County, New York, the Phoenicia Library. Uh, they had a fire. Um, and so we jokingly said they blazed a trail here. Uh, but they're going to be the first library in the country to be uh, certified under the Passive House Program, which means they didn't use any fancy technology. They just built a smarter outer shell of their building and made it more highly insulated. And now they're paying a heck of a lot less for their heating and cooling costs than they did in their old, less efficient building. So when we think about long-term sustainability, this hits on that issue of environmental sustainability because they're using less heating oil to heat that building. It talks about fiscal environmental, uh, sorry, fiscal sustainability, and they're paying far less for a much larger building. And looking at that picture, I want to tell you, it's designed with social equity in mind as well. Um, you'll notice that all the collection is on the outer walls of this library, and that is throughout the entire building, because they designed it to have people space in the middle of everything. That was the center of their design. Um, so if you're ever in New York, I encourage you to stop by. It's a very cool library, awesome people, and a fantastic pizza parlor called Brio's Two Doors Down. So two more points I want to make, and then I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, this is, a, again, one of my libraries, the, the Pauling Library. They had a bunch of kids come in one day and uh, ask if kids were allowed to borrow the library's meeting room. And uh, the children's librarian was a little suspicious. She's like, why? What are you up to? And she said, uh, we want to make the world suck less. And uh, the, library direct, the library director told me that her staff person paused and then said, you know what? That's what we do here. Let's see if we can make an exception for you. And they changed the library's policy to let uh, the teens use the meeting space. They signed over the programming budget for the teens to the kids, and the kids come up with community service projects that they choose and they implement using the platform of the library to make that work happen for their vision of how to make their world right in their own little corner of the world a little better. And I just think that really sums up the work that we do in libraries, making the world suck less, right? <laughs> So that really aligns with one of the trends you'll hear about from the Center uh, for the Future of Libraries, which is that idea of collective impact, um, that if we all want to make a difference, we can't do it in isolation. We have to agree on what the biggest problems are that are facing us, and we have to all work in the same direction to actually have an impact in this area. So we've really taken this idea to heart at the New York Library Association. We've created a sustainability initiative. Uh, so over the past four years, we've been developing resources and tools for our peers, um, which is uh, really volunteers a group. I'm a volunteer, as are my 20 committee members who do this work. We've created something called the Roadmap to Sustainability which is free for anyone, not just New Yorkers. You could download it right after this webinar. Uh, it's available as a PDF, as a print booklet, or you can get the mobile app that we had developed and have it right on your tablet or phone. But the roadmap, the idea here is that it defines some basic terms about sustainability, kind of like we did here today, but gives you a space to start gathering your own thinking about how these issues impact your work, wherever you happen to land in a library or what role you have at the library, to start to cohesively define your vision for a sustainable future that your library contributes to. You can sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to. Again, no charge. Um, and we also have, we're about to launch nationally, a sustainable library certification program. Um, because we would go out and do these presentations and talk about these big ideas and how important it was. And people would be so excited and I'd have a huge line of people waiting to talk to me afterwards. And they'd be like, Rebecca, I'm in. What do I do next? And I'm like, wow, there's like 10,000 things you could do next. Where should you start? Um, so our team put together a certification program that methodically walks a library through environmental choices, 
fiscal choices and social equity choices from an operational governance and program design perspective. So it's something you can get certified on as an institution, as a public library, as an institution, as an academic library, and as an individual, as a school librarian. So currently available only in New York, but later next year in 2020, you'll see this announced uh, nationwide. We're partnering with the American Library Association to bring this to all corners of the library world, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, so the third fourth thing we're working on is something called community change agents where we've actually created a professional development path for uh, real life library leaders to work with real life community leaders and partner up to figure out what they should join up and work on from a collective impact standpoint. Um, so we've done this uh, with four libraries so far. We had a library team up with their mayor and it was an area that didn't have good broadband connectivity and uh, through this project they now have good broadband connectivity which is pretty life-changing for a lot of people in that community. Um, so we're kind of creating a live laboratory to, to test out how you actually do collective impact work for libraries of all sizes. Uh, so if you're interested in knowing more about that, signing up for the newsletter is a good spot uh, to figure out what we're up to and follow the work that we're doing. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about really anything that I've been talking about today, I do maintain a Facebook page uh, because it's where I save all the ideas I like to integrate into my presentations later. So you can kind of see my stream of consciousness, the things that are catching my eye that fit with the model that we're working on uh, with the triple bottom line. So I'm going to pause to uh, and uh, maybe let me know it was important we leave time for questions, but I do want to make sure you have my contact info. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm pretty passionate about this kind of stuff. I love hearing from people who are doing work in the library field about your ideas on the topic, things you're already trying, things you want to try in the future. Um, so I hope you will take the time to connect uh, online and social media. I'm on a, probably all the social media platforms, and if you run into me in a conference, I hope you'll introduce yourself. Um, but I'll, I'll stop talking now and see if there's any questions questions that you might have or comments you'd like to make. Oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was um, really informative. While we're on this page and before other people get their questions ready and people you can um, either type them into the chat or we'll let you take your um, microphones off in a minute. Can you tell us um, the difference between the two books that you've written that are here at the bottom, the sustainable thinking and the resilience. I know you've, you've talked about those during this presentation, but yeah, sure. The, the focus of them. So in my mind, there's three different phases of capacity for a library. You're either, you're sustainable, which if you look up the definition, you have the capacity to endure, which is not very sexy, but it's, it is the basics. It is the meat and potatoes of actually being a quality library. So sustainable thinking focuses, focuses on that aspect of being a sustainable library, of really picking apart why you do what you do, how you get community feedback, how it ties into these bigger ideas of environmental sustainability, and it has worksheets at the end of each chapter to help you capture your thinking or do a little homework that will help inform future decisions you make as a library leader. Resilience is a much shorter, uh, smaller little booklet almost, which is part of a series from the, the, future, the Center for the Future, which uh, Miguel, who runs the Center for the Future, identified community resilience issues as a very uh, top trend that libraries need to be thinking about. So that booklet does a little bit of overview of the sustainable thinking model, but takes a much deeper dive into resiliency in terms of how do we build in uh, the ability for our libraries and our communities to bounce back in the face of some shocks to the system we might experience, whether they be from the, an environmental issue or a technological issue like hacking and ransomware or an economic uh, downfall like we had in uh, 2008 with the recession. So really just thinking about the elasticity of planning for the future and being more resilient uh, in the face of that. So I'd say they're almost building on each other. I'd recommend you start with sustainable thinking and then go to resilience. Thanks for that clarification. Um, and I'm just going to take over one more question and I'll let others have it. But um, we've got a couple faculty here, um, as well as some students. What would you think would be the best way to um, inform our students um, about these different issues of um, community impact? And uh, how have you, it's a two part, the examples that you have of these different libraries, did they come to you or did you seek them out? And I'm just wondering if, because um, I know some libraries have done the beekeeping, have done the um, urban farming. Is that a grassroots thing or, or what can you tell us about that? So I guess 
what can we do to prepare our students for these things, you know, a special course, and then um, how are people, professionals, um, gaining traction with these different projects? I mean, I might be biased, but I, I do think some of these issues should be threaded throughout almost every course in a library school program um, for people who are working on a youth services track or an administration track to really understand the triple bottom line and the impact that the decisions they make wherever they are in the community, uh, and I'm sorry, in the organization, uh, how they make better decisions using this lens of the triple bottom line. Um, is it a, a full semester long class, given how much I talk about it, probably. <laughs> um, I think it's a big issue and it's an overwhelming topic for people. So. I think as students uh, to see where the entry points are to get started to have impact um, to understand their um, scope of uh, authority and influence in their library regardless of what their role is and to really understand that bigger vision for what libraries can mean to a community or on a campus or in a school setting um, I think it's it's pretty important to give people context for the work and to have our traditional library education embedded in that as it's a core value in the future of our profession um, so I think that this construct or a vision that we have about how we will play a role in the future sustainability of our communities and in the lives of the people that we serve, it really does need to be a core aspect of the development of future library leaders. And we've been focused on that in New York through our Leadership and Management Academy that we have here. And it's been working really well. Um, so now people send me examples of what they're doing and what they're working on. Uh, but I'll say that for 20 years as someone who does a lot of consulting, I'm constantly scanning. I'm constantly looking and I'm reading the journal and I'm watching on social media and I'm hearing from peers about cool things they're seeing or I'll ask a bunch of my colleagues like I'm looking for a library that does something like this have you seen that and then what I'm doing is looking for patterns I'm trying to see our libraries picking up the pace on something is it is it effective because we you know we're all library scientists trying to figure out will this work will this make a difference and if we can connect more and share more information about what worked and what didn't when you figure out what's going on in your community and you know this is the challenge facing the people that I serve as a consultant if I'm able to recall hey I've got four examples of another community it might be out in Oregon but here's how they manage this this might work for you so I just I feel like it's part of my own professional development to constantly be checking out what the other libraries are up to that's great. I do have one more question and then I will turn it over. Do you have an example of um, what an academic library would do? And I can see the school libraries and the public libraries and you gave some really great examples for that. But what, ap ac what are academic libraries doing? Yeah, we're seeing academic, academic libraries who are um, creating subject specialists in their libraries who are working with professors throughout the university on topics related to sustainability. Most academic institutions themselves, not just the library, but the institution of the university or the college, they are usually more progressive on the topic of environmental sustainability than the public libraries and the school libraries. So I think they actually have a leg up in having campus sustainability teams and making sure the library as part of that work is something we identified in New York wasn't happening. Um, so not only having services at the library, but being part of that wider campus conversation about sustainability, the choices the university might be making, and how the library plays a role in that helps the library better position itself to be useful to campus administration, to professors who are working on new curriculum related to sustainability, uh, as well as modeling good choices in the administration of the academic library. Um, so it does, in a weird way, follow the same model as the public's right you're you're leading by example in the library you're developing services and programs that respond to the needs of uh, professors and students who are making a study of these issues and you've also got that wider connection with administration who has some very big decisions to make in the future uh, we our first step for our academic libraries and our certification program is to find out if their college or university president has signed the climate pledge um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the footprint of the university and if not for the library staff to advocate for that for their university which can really change the conversation campus-wide um, so I think the biggest thing that's across all three types of libraries is that library leaders understand that they can step into a space and be a sustainability leader as well and they often might be the first person in their institution talking about that which I think brings the library a lot of great attention raises profile and gives the library more respect in terms of being a future focused leader Gave me some great ideas. Cheryl, I'll turn it um, over to you. And then um, if anybody has a question or a comment, please raise your hand or type it in chat. 
Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you, Rebecca, so much. What a powerhouse. You're a great speaker. And like Sue said, obviously, um, care deeply about these issues, but also have uh, a huge amount of information to share with everyone um, and, and to share it so freely. It's wonderful. I have a question um, for our students or maybe uh, our recent grads who maybe are thinking about this or uh, thinking, uh, they're working on this in their first jobs. And I know you said, um, and of course, every library is going to be different. Every situation is different. All of the, you know, the issues are inherently local. But would you be able to suggest um, a, the top two or three partners that public libraries should be seeking out to further their sustainability efforts within their local communities? If you could give us, you know, kind of, in your opinion, the ones that are pretty uniform to go after? I think always aligning with your municipality to find out, you know, read their master plan, understand if they've been doing some thinking on the topic of sustainability and how they're thinking about approaching it, because hopefully they've based their master plan on community input. Um, <laughs> it, sometimes they don't, but if they have, that's a huge amount of market research already done for a library. Um, so I, what I've noticed in my region is when libraries have done that work and aligned some of their efforts with their municipality, it has brought great deal of uh, uh, PR for that library, sometimes money to the library. Great example is one of mine, the Kingston Library. Um, they were uh, really paying attention to what the plan, the town was planning, the city was planning. Um, they have a huge issue with stormwater runoff that they have uh, completely paved surfaces in the, the whole city. So where does all the water go? And it was becoming a real problem for the stormwater management system, which wasn't designed for that amount of pavement. And so the town, uh, the city was focused on that issue. So the library aligned their facility planning with that issue as well saying we're going to be a partner in figuring this problem out. Uh, we'd like to be a demonstration site for how to do landscaping that absorbs more water onto our property. And the city was just so grateful that another institution recognized the importance of the issue. They came and consulted on it. They got a lot of in-kind services from the city, as well as a partial uh, a part of a Main Street grant that the city had gotten for themselves. They unprecedentedly gave some of that money to the library, which is a separate uh, entity. Um, so I think municipalities are really critical. And I think the public schools are really critical um, to find out what teachers are, are struggling with to help connect kids with some of these issues. Sometimes they are viewed as politically sensitive and libraries can help desensitize them. Um, that's one of the biggest fallacies out there that there's all these climate change deniers and they're anti-tax people and they're going to cream you if you talk about this kind of stuff. That is a fallacy. There is uh, less and less people who deny this is an issue. And so that's a big excuse we use sometimes to not expose our kids to some of these issues. But uh, if you ever want to see a very cool speaker on the topic of sustainability, uh, Rebecca Miller, who's the executive editor of Library Journal and School Library Journal, she speaks so eloquently about inviting children to do this work with us, to help problem solve for the future with us right now, not waiting till they're 16 or 18, but right now and introduce the issues, help them understand why it is the way it is and ask them to get creative about it. So municipalities and schools really natural partners in some of this work and really, I think, pays off for the library to demonstrate leadership with those two entities. And then you'll find, I think, more niche agencies, depending on where you are in the country. You might have um, an environmental conservation department or a resource recovery department that could be a natural partner in some of this work. But that varies from uh, region to region in the country, I've discovered. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Deborah. I can see that you've had your hand up. Do you want to grab the mic? Yeah, and it actually, the question I have bounces really nicely, I think, Rebecca, off of what you were just talking about. Um, in your uh, your presentation, you, you use that really great example of everybody working in the same direction that had those really vivid images. I was just talk, wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you do that, um, particularly around sustainability that has, you know, this, as you said, this sort of the feel of controversy around it, even though it's not a particularly controversial topic. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but it is something that, you know, sort of, you know, it's a little, sometimes it can feel, well, regardless of the initiative you're trying to do, sometimes mm -hmm. it can feel a bit like herding cats. And so mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about how you do that. I think the, the, in my experience, first you have to identify if you're the right agency to be in the lead on something. You have to do a very good environmental scan to understand who else might be doing work in that area or thinking in that area. And then deciding what is your role as an institution or a library leader? Is it to join a group that's already doing some of that work? Is it to convene several groups that are doing the work in isolation and get them all together? Is it to actually identify what we should be working on? <laughs> um, sometimes communities are all over the place and 
not focused enough. Uh, really cool example here in New York from the Rochester Public Library in Central New York, where the entire community, from the mayor to the schools to uh, the library and all the other social services agencies agreed, the number one thing we should work on is alleviating childhood poverty. And they have gone at it with a vengeance from every angle they can think of. Um, so it could be, I think, three of, it could be any of those three models where you have to figure out where to kind of jump into the stream and find your way forward to be part of collective action. I will, if I could just amend that, I would say that the, um, the Library Transforming commu Communities tools from the American Library Association, particularly the Turning Outwards Toolkit, which is freely available on ALA's website, we use that like crazy here in my system. Uh, we use it to help our libraries uh, figure out what the key issues are and who the key players are, which helps libraries do strategic planning and figuring out where to direct their efforts. Um, so if you want to talk about doing it from the ground up, that's an amazing place to start. Thank you. I see we've got one question, uh, Rebecca, in the um, chat. I know we're right again at the top of the hour, so I understand some people might have to sign out. We'll continue recording for another minute or two, um, and I'll ask <laughs> if you've got uh, the time to address this question. I, I think there's just so many that we um, have uh, uh, taken up all of your time um, without even realizing it. So. Um, would that be okay if you just stayed for another minute to answer a question that's shown up in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then after that, we will um, wrap it up and suggest people can follow up uh, with you um, if they have further questions, uh, because this is such a, uh, an exciting topic. So the question comes from Karen. She says, it seems like local churches also need to work on sustainability. Have you seen successful partnerships with the library and churches, maybe in the areas of using educational programs such as youth technology uh, use or helping the home homeless? I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, so Karen, one of the cool things I've seen is that the Pope <laughs> has come out as an environmentalist uh, and has called on the his Catholic parishioners to take climate change seriously and to work locally to figure this out. So there is a call in the religious community to do work in this area. I can't point to any um, examples of programming um, per se that's being done in conjunction because I think many libraries are careful, uh, public libraries at least careful not to be seen as sectarian. Um, but I am seeing churches being invited to meetings they weren't invited to before on collective impact projects. Um, so oddly enough, tomorrow uh, in here in New York, we're piloting a new statewide program called The Great Give Back. Uh, and you can learn more about it at thegreatgiveback.org. But it's encouraging our every library in the state, and this is our pilot year, and we got to 20% of our libraries, which was way beyond our goal. Um, but we've got 20% of our libraries in the whole state doing community <laughs> service projects, which are taking all types of shapes and forms. And I found one actually just last week where they partnered with a local church to do a food and coat drive. Um, so I think you've got community-minded people who care about their neighbors and again just like the example with the first responders they want to make the world a better place and they're using their church as the platform to do so just like we use our libraries to do it um, just like the first responders use their firehouse to do it. Thank you Rebecca wonderful um I, I, again, I hate to cut us off, but we're now pushing beyond the hour, and I know you're uh, incredibly busy. That's clear from the work that you've shared with us. On behalf of the Leadership and Management Committee at the iSchool, we um, want to thank you um, very much for taking the time to talk with us today, for allowing us to record this so that people can download it and hear it uh, for um, months and years to come, and uh, for being, again, so generous to share uh, in sharing um, the wealth of information that you've accumulated over the um, decades that you've been working on this uh, and showing your um, absolute expertise in this area. It's very inspirational. So thank you so much, Rebecca. And um, thank you everyone for coming to our live recording. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will see other people in the downloads. Cool. Thanks for having me.